Hi, my name is Brad and I'm the pastor at Community Fellowship. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering. What you're going to see today is people worshiping God with great music and listening to teaching from the Bible that will help them live their lives. And we're excited about the fact that you're joining with us in that. If you have any questions, please ask them. If you have statements to make, make comments. And if you think this could help people around you, share this video so that others may join us. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'll come back and see you again in the middle and the end of the video.
Amen. It's so good to have you guys with us. Grab a seat for just a moment. As many of you know, we have a team of 26 people who have returned from a mission trip in Mexico where we had the opportunity to build a home for a family uh, that, was, uh, that was there and was living in a 10 by 10, a 10 by 10 block closet is really the best way for us to describe uh, where they were living. And it was such a wonderful experience. You're going to hear a lot about that today. But uh, we're going to take up our offering during the beginning of the next song. And, and I just wanted to just illustrate something to you today. I, people have been asking me all morning, did you have a good time? Did you have a good time? And I, 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 it was a wonderful experience, but I don't think I would ever describe it as a good time. And, and the reason that is true is that when you see real poverty, you forget your own problems. Like, all of a sudden you start thinking, you, you know how the hashtag first world problems has kind of gone around uh, recently. And, you know, we're like, man, I really wanted the 48 inch TV, but I only had enough money for the 36 inch. You know, like, uh, I'm so bummed, <laughs> you know. And, and so I, I, I tell you this today because although we are never going to be the church that motivates people to give through guilt or those kinds of things. We're never going to do that. But at the same time, I want to remind us of this because I was reminded this week that we are wealthy people. We are wealthy people. If you make $30,000 a year, you're in the top five or 6% of the globe's wealth. Like we are wealthy. We may not always feel wealthy when we compare ourselves to the person who lives across the street or down the way, or the person who sits behind me in church or in my Sunday school class. We may not feel as wealthy as them, but when we get our eyes outside of our own little community and we look at what's happening globally, it's just, bl just blatantly clear that we are wealthy people. And I want to remind all of us, as I've been reminded this week, that there is a responsibility when you have because God's children all over this globe most of whom do not have they just don't it's one thing to say man I've been blessed God bless America God's blessed me but God doesn't bless us just to give us stuff God blesses us to empower us to bless others that's the reason we're blessed that, that is that's why it's there I guarantee you God's never gonna bless me financially just so I get the bigger television never going to happen. But God will bless you and I with the opportunity to be a blessing to others. I realized while we were in Mexico that I could give a family an amount of money that was in my wallet that I couldn't even remember. Like I thought through how much money is in my wallet and I couldn't remember exactly how much I had. And I realized that with the difference between what I thought I had and what I actually had, in my wallet, I could give a family one or two weeks worth of their income. And I would, like, to call that a sacrifice is a stretch, right? That's not even really a sacrifice. That's, I don't even know I had it, right? And so today, I just want to encourage you, and I'm not talking about today's offering, and I'm not talking about how many zeros are on your check today, but I just want to encourage each of us to be generous people and to realize that generosity is at the heart of God and generosity should matter to us because God has blessed us to be a blessing. And I can tell you this, is that we as a church will always do everything that we can with the offering that is given here to make sure that we are good stewards of that offering and make a way to use it to bless God's people all around the globe, okay? Would you pray with me as we ask this offering to be blessed? And then ushers, would you guys join me down front? Lord, we pray today to you because we trust you. Lord, we don't trust money. We trust you. We don't trust credit cards. We trust you. We don't trust checking accounts. We trust you. We don't trust any of those other things, Lord. We realize that you give them to us as tools to use. But we also realize, Lord, that if we're going to trust you, it means we have to listen to you. And if we trust you and we listen to you, then we believe you're going to give us direction. And if we trust you and we're listening to you and you give us direction, then we need to follow that direction. So, Father, I pray that you would continually give us direction at how we should handle our wealth and how you would have us 
behave and live and operate as generous people. Jesus, we trust you with this. In all things, we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your prayer. Of what I've 
ain't you glad that we have a father that's unconditional with his love? He just gives and gives and does not want anything in return. Just, just sing this last verse with me. Would you close your eyes with me? In just a moment, we're going to take communion together during this next song. And communion is um, its a ritualistic remembrance. Something that Jesus told his earliest followers to continue doing. And it pointed back to a particular moment he spent with his closest followers. Where just before Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane on what we call Good Friday, just before he goes there to pray, he sits down with the 12 and he has the Passover meal with them. If you could, in your mind, as you close your eyes, could you take yourself there? In a room where you know, if you're in the mind of Christ, you know that you're about to be arrested. You're about to be brutally treated. And in the next few hours, you'll be crucified and you will die. Now, no one else around you understands that. The others in the room simply think they're doing something they've done every year, all of their life. Just another church ritual. A meal with special meats and special spices and special bread and special wine. And so they prepare that meal just like they did last year and the year before and the year before that. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever get in, you ever get in the routine of just doing spiritual stuff? Just going to church, just singing songs, just reading the Bible, just doing whatever. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything different today than it did the last time you did it. It's just what you do, right? That's probably what they were doing, just going through the motions of experiencing this meal, this meal that was also familiar. But it wasn't familiar to Jesus. This was a first time thing for him not to take this particular meal, but to use this meal in this particular way. Because what he's about to do is he's about to show his, his followers, 
the 12 disciples, that the bread that they're eating is a foreshadowing, a precursor to his own body, which will be broken for the sins of all mankind. And he's about to show them that the wine that they've been drinking is to remind them of his blood, which is going to be spilled out as a sacrifice for sins. He begins to show them what God has been planning and doing throughout all of eternity. But they're still not there. They still don't quite get it, right? Which brings me to another question. You ever find yourself not quite getting what God's telling you? Or maybe looking back afterward, realizing, man, he's been telling me that for a long time. And I wasn't quite getting it. I just wasn't really seeing it clearly. That was their experience. In fact, one of the 12 had something else going on in his mind. One of the 12 wasn't really paying attention to the Passover. He certainly wasn't paying attention to the sacrifices that Jesus was about to make. He was actually paying attention to how he would go about betraying Jesus. The distrust had grown strong in him. And he was ready to change sides, so to speak. I've always thought it was interesting that Jesus served him communion that night. Jesus didn't call him out by name, although he did point out that one of them would betray him. So where are you and I today? Where are you? Are you the one who is going through the spiritual routine of daily life? It's Sunday morning, so you're at church and that's about it. Maybe this moment of remembrance needs to shake into you the reality that Jesus is alive and well. His spirit lives in your heart and he has a calling and a passion for who you are and what you are to do with the life he's given you. Maybe you're the one who's presently tempted in sin. You've fallen a lot recently. You've planned on or thought about your future failings. And like Judas, there's a sense in which you feel like the betrayer. So you could handle this differently than Judas did. Instead of planning the betrayal and then going and doing it, you could actually repent of that. Come to Jesus right now with your heartfelt desire to follow him. And I want to promise you that because his body and his blood were shed on that cross, then your heartfelt offer of repentance will be received with grace and mercy. So return to him today. Maybe you're the one who feels like you're making all the sacrifices. Maybe you're the one that's thinking about all that you have to do and all that needs to be accomplished and all the worries that seem to be running through your mind. Let me just point this out before we take communion today that the sacrifice Christ has made is an eternal one and it is sufficient for your needs. And so although there may be responsibilities for you in this life, there may be things you need to do, I want you to understand very clearly that you are not doing those to in some way impress or earn God's love because God's love for you was solidified in the sacrifice that his son made for you. So let him be the one with the stress today. Let him be the one with the pressure. Let him be the one with the sacrifice. And you just remember. Because during this next song, our deacons are going to come forward. If you guys would go ahead and join me, those of you who are going to serve. They're going to pass out to you uh, as you as you sing and, and are where you are in the aisles. They will bring to you a piece of bread and a cup fruit of the vine and if you would hold both of those just hold them in your hand about halfway through the song i'm going to come back up and we're going to take communion together okay this is a moment of worship this is a moment of remembrance this is a moment when we make sure our focus and our attention is on christ let me give you this job to do if you would while the the first few verses of the song are sung first of all sing along worship him but in doing so internally if you would go to Christ think about yourself your own walk with God 
consider this an altar moment and talk to him. Where are you? Where are you with him? Where are you in following him? Is there a sin you need to confess to him? Is there, is there a struggle you need to bring to him? Is there a thanksgiving you need to express to him? Make sure you do that. Right in these next few moments, the scripture tells us to examine ourselves. Let's do that during the first couple of verses of the song. As we sing, as we celebrate, as we hold the bread and hold the cup, let's go to him. And then in just a moment, we will remember him in this meal together. Let's worship him. Thank you, man. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone and I'm no longer From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again to your family, and your blood flows through. You know, it's interesting, the things that can distract us in this world from what matters. Um,
and at the same time, the importance of keeping our focus and not being distracted. Today, we're not distracted. This is just a cup of grape juice, right? But it's not. It's not every cup of grape juice reminds me of Jesus. Not every cup of grape juice points to his blood. This one does, and we're doing this together. This one points to the reality that without that one moment where the Son of God went through his calling and sacrificed to the point of his own death for you and for me and for us and for other believers all over the globe, We're reminded that our entire eternal existence was at the crux that day on the cross. And Jesus gave his everything for us. And so today we celebrate him. And we realize that giving our everything is not nearly as important as Jesus giving his. But at the same time, we want to respond with that same kind of devotion where As I take this bread and I drink this cup, I'm reminded that Jesus saved all of me. And he saved all of you. In spite of me and in spite of you. For his purposes and his glory. So today, we eat and we drink this together. But for for today as well, we also live for his glory and for his purpose. Amen? Amen. Take with me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we drink this cup. We eat this bread in remembrance of all that you've done. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him. our trip there was a family across the street who had been a blessing to us you'll hear more about them we tried to give them a gift they would take nothing we tried to give them money they wouldn't take it we tried to give them things that we had they wouldn't take it and so our teenagers and our adults who were there decided that we would sing for them that's the gift we we tried to give them a gift and they wouldn't take it so we went and we sang this song and I want you to sing it with me Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. Jesus, we worship you. Amen. Be seated. There are so many important things happening today, and uh, if you notice, I'm a little bit off. I'm Recovering from the 23 hours in a car that we spent yesterday and the day before that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I told the men who pray for me graciously every Sunday morning that uh, today's got to be a day when God does something really big because I got nothing. I mean, I just, I'm, I, I'm really thinking about grabbing the stool. You know what I mean? Like I'm sitting on it. I, so I, I want to just tell you a few things before we get started with today's teaching and, and the opportunities that we have to celebrate all that God has been doing 
Uh, there are a couple of things that are less important than others. Okay, so let me, let me tell you some things happening. Um, first, uh, light up the sky for Christ. That, that is our event that we've done every year for a long time. Uh, it is one of the region's best fireworks displays. But for us, it's bigger than that. It's when we bring our community together. We had over 1,000 people here last year in the parking lot to watch the fireworks, eat hot dogs, and have lots of fun. Uh, that is developing and growing. I want to tell you a couple of things about it. One, uh, we are trying to actually kind of relax some of the effort that we put into it because it's one of those events that as it grows, you end up with 20 or 30 people who just work themselves to death. And at the end of the day, everybody's happy, but they're exhausted, you know, and, and drained, and they don't feel like they had a great time at all. They feel like, you know, they, they deserve to be paid overtime that day. You know, like that's, and so we're trying, to, we're trying to make that better for everybody. So we do have opportunities to serve, but we're trying to make sure we do it in a way that makes it uh, enjoyable and pleasant for everybody. So you can sign up to serve parking, or you can sign up to serve safety and security. You can be a part of that. Uh, we will have a um, you know medical team here. When you have a thousand people on your property, uh, the first day of July when it's that hot, you want to make sure that we take care of people if there's a problem. We'll have water stations and different things like that. So what we're doing a little different. We did a little last year. We're doing even more this year. Is we're inviting other nonprofits uh, like Ladies Living Free from Paducah, um, lots of different ministries that that will be here. And so they're actually going to have booths set up throughout the the area. And some of them will be giving stuff away. Some of them will be selling. Stuff. I think they deep fried things like Oreos last year, and that was a big hit. So those kinds of things will be happening again. Uh, it's going to be just a fantastic day. It's July 1st. That's a Sunday, okay? Uh, uh, there are still some thoughts out there. I've had a few people that say, I thought we always did that on a Saturday. Well, I think we always did that on a Saturday until last year. And last year we did it on a Sunday, and it worked so well that we're going to do it on a Sunday again this year. So it's a Sunday night. We're starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, in the parking lot, there'll be live music on a, on a bandstand outside. There'll be, uh, there's a live band coming. It's going to be playing for us. Our own praise team's putting together some songs. It's going to be a fun, fun, fun day. And then at dusk, when the, when the dark hits, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 o'clock, we'll shoot off the fireworks. So uh, having said that, we're ordering T-shirts kind of leading up to that. And I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to get a T-shirt. And so I want to just tell you how we're doing this. Um, we're doing them, the t-shirts, the t-shirts cost the church six bucks. We're selling them to you for five bucks. Okay. So basically we're, we're going to eat that a little bit. The church is going to eat a dollar per shirt financially because we want you to get a shirt, but we also don't have the finances to buy everybody a shirt. Like that would be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So, so if they're five bucks, uh, if you have a family of 11, you know what I mean? Like just keep having babies, you know, those folks, I got them, uh, the, then, Come and talk to me. I will probably work out maybe some free T-shirts there for you, okay? But but not not eleven free T-shirts, but some to help out with the with with the you know with the clan. You know, I want to help out with that. But for those of us like myself, I got two kids. You know, I, I can buy five, four T-shirts for my wife and I kids. So the the thing about the T-shirt though, it's it's a really special T-shirt for us this year because it's not just a church shirt. Um, this shirt it, it's going to mean a lot for us long term. Um, as you've heard me say in the in the recent past. The words belong, believe, and become are quickly working their way into our kind of working mission statement, like what we do and the way we do it. And one of the ways that I believe God is adjusting and changing and directing and guiding us is through those three words, what it means to belong, what it means to believe, and what it means to become. And so this shirt, it doesn't say light up the sky. It doesn't say any of those things. This shirt, just in a really cool way that Josh Jackson personally designed for us, just says belong, believe, and become with the big logo cross that we have outside. That, that's it. It's that simple. You can see mock-ups of this on the table out there or here. But the reason I'm telling you this is in order for us to get these ordered, we, we have to order them June 17th. Now, what is today? Today's June 17th. Do you guys get why this is important? Okay, so here's what you can't do. You can't go, I'll order mine next Sunday. No, I'm sorry, you can't. We're ordering them tomorrow, okay? So uh, we want to make sure that you get a chance to do this. The hope is that you would sign up and give five bucks and we would order your t-shirt. If for some reason you have five bucks on you today, you're going to order the t-shirt, order the t-shirt, okay? Order the t-shirt and, and we'll, you know, we will hide it from you until you give us five bucks. So I'm just kidding, but we you know like we, we want we we'll help you do that. So I just want to make sure that, that you don't miss out on it if you really wanted one. Okay, so we'll probably order a few extra, 
but nowhere near enough for everybody to just say, I'll get it when, the, you know, it light up the sky. Don't do that. We will run out. Okay, so, so order one today for you or your family members or your next door neighbor or your grandpa, whoever. Like order one of these. It'd be a great Father's Day gift. So uh, do that. Again, we're not making money off of it. We're losing a buck on every shirt. I'm just telling you that we want you to have it, okay? We want you to have it, and we believe it's a good thing. And I believe God will use this particular shirt to help remind us of God's calling in our life. Words like belong, believe, and become, okay? So very good. I wanted to make sure that you got that. We are in the third week teaching through the book of Jonah. Um, you guys have heard great sermons. Uh, help, help me out here in thanking them. You've heard great sermons from Tyson Lindsay two weeks ago. Would you guys say, yeah, absolutely. Say thanks to Tyson. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of what God's doing in his life. I'm excited about that. Last week, Mr. Keith brought it, didn't he? I tell you what, here's what I heard about. And I haven't got a chance to tell you this, Keith, but I've had multiple people come to me and say, that man is so genuine. And let me tell you something. There is no better compliment. You know, there's no better compliment. So uh, I love you, man. And, 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 and from my perspective, I've always loved being a part of a teaching team at a church where instead of just being thought of as the preacher or the one guy who stands on stage and talks, I just want you to know something. There are other godly men in this church who have things to say, and God's going to say things through them occasionally, and I'm going to get out of their way and let God say it. And, and that's just a good process for us to have as a church. Uh, I'll still be, I'll always speak the majority of the time, but that's, that's going to be the occasional thing. I love the way that has worked through June. And next week, next week, I want to let you know that Adam is going to be speaking. Where, where Adam's probably in here. He's, he's played bass this morning. Adam is, is a, there he is back there. Yeah, just look for the glare. You see the glare? Oh, I'm sorry, Adam. Uh, Adam, Adam actually be, this is the first time you've preached, right? This will be Adam's first sermon next week. He's been, he's pumped. And if you have not gotten to know him, and he's kind of quiet maybe in public, I sat beside him in a car for 50 hours in the, last, in the last week. And I'm telling you, this guy is golden. I mean, he is just, God is doing some beautiful, beautiful things through him. And you are definitely going to want to hear what God has to say through him next week. So uh, we will wrap up the Jonah series next week and kick off another series starting in, uh, in July. But it's just, just a beautiful, beautiful time for us. So open your Bibles to chapter three. I get the fun one. Everybody else gets the stories about Jonah saying no to God and Jonah getting kicked off a boat, Jonah being swallowed by a whale, Jonah having to live in the stomach of a whale, Jonah being vomited by a whale. There's nothing fun about that at all, right? That sounds like horrible, doesn't it? Can you think of anything that would be a worse day than being vomited out by a whale? Maybe, maybe going the other direction. That's the only thing that I can think of that might be worse than being vomited out by a whale. You don't want that at all. Uh, this is the story, uh, uh, this is a true story of how God changed a man's mind, okay? This is, how, this is what happens. Now, without, without sharing the details, I just want to ask you, has God ever changed your mind? Have you ever been in a situation where you were headed down a certain road and God changed your mind? Are you glad as we read through this that you don't live close to the ocean? Right? God did not have to use a whale to pull it off, right? There are other things God does in our life to change our mind, and that is exactly what we're going to learn today. Now, here's what's interesting about Jonah. Uh, the book is named after him, but Jonah is really not a hero, okay? I'm not trying to be disrespectful to a historical figure in the scriptures, but there is no doubt that God is the hero of the book of Jonah, okay? God is the hero, not Jonah. Uh, we could have named it like God and the goofy guy. That's what it could have been named because Jonah makes bad decision after bad decision. And even when Jonah makes good decisions, he tends to do it with the wrong attitude. Like, have you, let me ask you that. Have you ever done that? You ever did what God told you to do reluctantly and with a frown? I know God wants me to do this, but I don't like that idea at all. But I'm going to do it anyway because I'm afraid of a whale. Like that's what's going to happen, right? That's what happens in this story. God started the whole thing, as you've already learned from Tyson. You've already learned uh, fr from the first two sermons, as Keith spoke last week. Uh, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach uh, the gospel. God, God told him to go there and share the story of God's judgment on them and tell them to repent. That's, that's what they had to do. Jonah said, I would rather God smite them than me warn them. Like, no, God, I don't want to, I'm not going to warn my enemies that you're about to bomb them. I would rather just keep my mouth shut and let you bomb them. I hate them. I hate them. Why in the world 
Would I help them? That's what's happening in this story. So Jonah says, if the only possible way that the Ninevites will repent is that I tell them they need to repent, then I'm going to get on a boat and head the other direction. That's because I don't want anything to do with them not being killed. I want them to die. Can you understand the kind of hatred that he had in his heart for these people? So he gets on a boat. He goes, you guys know the story, right? Uh, God says, no, no, buddy, this is not going to work like that. Brings up a great storm, scares the people on the boat to death to the point that they ultimately ask him to exit, right? Okay, Lord, we, we do not want to be a part of you offending God. So get off our boat, right? Jonah's gone, goes in the water. God sends a great whale. Now, most people don't think of this whale as a blessing, but the truth is when you're treading water in open ocean, anything that will come and swallow you up and give you oxygen and make you not have to swim anymore is a good thing, right? So the, 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 the whale swallows him up, gives him something to breathe. All of a sudden now Jonah can rest and in the belly of the whale, God changes his mind. So the, the whale vomits him out on the, on the land and basically God goes, Jonah, I think you're heading the wrong direction. Nineveh is that way. I told you to go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh, right? So Jonah does. Now in chapter three, we get the story of what God wanted from the beginning. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Jonah tells them God's going to judge them and smite them if they don't change. They change. God has grace and mercy on them, and great things happen. Now, you would think, right, you would think this would make Jonah happy. It doesn't really make Jonah happy, and you'll learn more about that next week, okay? So let's read this together, chapter 3. We're going to read all the way through the verse. It's, it's just 10 verses long. This is what happens. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I, I love that, and I'd just like to leave that there for a second. Uh, this, this is when God tells him again, okay? Many translations use the word again. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah again. Let me ask you for just a second. Uh, can you think of moments in your life where you needed to hear what you were supposed to do one, one more time? Like, could you, what, 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 was, what was that? that was, can you tell me one more, one more time? I can think of moments uh, when I was playing ball and being coached when I needed to go to the coach and say, what? What did you tell me to do? Or moments when I am married, you know, and I'm supposed to do something a certain way, and I do it the wrong way, and Stephanie says, why did you do it the wrong way? And I said, I'm sorry, I thought I did it the wrong way. Could you, the right way, could you tell me again what you needed, right, when you have to go back and start over? That's what's happening in this situation. Jonah heard the word of the Lord. Jonah did the word of the, ro- the word of the, wor- Jonah did it wrongly. He went the wrong way, and now he's hearing it again, okay? So same message Second time, that's what's happening. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, which again, probably just irked him. Like, I don't want to call it a great city. I hate it, right? The great city, call out against it the message that I tell you. That's what God says. He goes on. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days' journey in breadth. In other words, to walk around town took three days to do it all. It's huge, okay? That's, that's, he, Jonah began to go into the city, and, and he went a, he, going a day's journey, so he's a third of the way in, and he calls out, uh, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay, so he's preaching that it's all about to end. You have 40 days, and God's going to end this. It's going to happen. It's going to be over with. Verse 5 says this. It's, it's this fast, okay? And the people of Nineveh believed God. Bam. God said, go tell them to repent. Jonah chases a whale, boat gets gone, two chapters of total mess up, finally comes back, chapter three, God reminds him what to say. He goes, he says of it, and from verse four to verse five, change happens again. Not only does God change Jonah's mind in this story, but God changes the mind of the Ninevites in this story. And the people of Nineveh believed God. It's on sackcloth. Sackcloth, by the way, is an outer expression of an inner turmoil. So the idea is I'm sad, I'm mourning, I'm repentant, I'm changing my attitude, and my clothing on the outside tells the world that that's where I'm at right now. Okay, that, that's what sackcloth is. So it says they called for a fast, they put on sackcloth, and from the greatest of them to the least of them, everybody did it. Okay? Verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he removed his robe. 
he covered himself in sackcloth and he sat in ashes. Another way of, of saying, I'm not the king today. Do you understand what's happening? From the, from the least of the people all the way to the king of the most arrogant country on the planet, or the city, I mean, and he steps down from his throne and he takes off all of his thronely garb. He removes himself as king and he repents before the Lord. Like that. Verse 6. We were, in verse 4, we're just telling them what to do. In verse 5, they do it. In verse 6, even the king does it. In verse 7, this is what the king says. He issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste or eat or drink anything. Let them not feed or drink any water. In other words, everybody's fasting. Everybody's fasting. Next, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out, to, call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in, that, that's in his hands. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger toward us so that we will not perish. In other words, maybe, 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 if we behave right, get right, have the best attitude, maybe the punishment we have earned, God will spare us. And I love this in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Other translations actually say God changed his mind. Okay? It's not so much changing his mind as it is saying, I'm going to do this unless you do that. But then they did what they were supposed to do, so God kept his end of the bargain. He said, I'm not going to do it. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning, just a little, because we've got not nearly as much time as we normally do, but I want to talk to you about being a sent people. Because in America, we get it wrong. We just get it wrong. So many of us think that being a Christian is about coming to church. It's about coming to church. And so we ask questions like, are you in church? You guys know what that means, right? You're culturally Graves County enough to get that, right? Are you in church? That means on Sundays, most of the time, do you get up and go to a church that your mama says is a good enough church for you to go to? That's what being in church means in your family in Western Kentucky, okay? Right? So that, that's, that's, what that, that's what that means. Like as, as, long as, as long as whoever it is that's asking you that question approves of the church that you're attending, as long as you are attending uh, fairly often, you know, then, then that you're in church. Here's what we've done. We've reduced, we've reduced following the amazing and mighty creator of the world all the way down to making sure we attend one hour on a Sunday. That's what we've done. Just, just as long as you're in church, man, it's good. As long as you're in church. You need to understand something. Jonah was in church. We don't know all the details, but Jonah is a prophet. Jonah is a religious man. Jonah is a man who God had used, no doubt, in other places and in other times. Jonah was in church. God calls Jonah to go out of church. God calls Jonah to leave church, like go do something. Get out of your chair, out of your pew, out of your, out of your normal routine of what it is that you're doing and go there. Go there and do something. I'm trying to illustrate for us today what is so kind of jumbled up in my head and my heart that I feel like I could preach eight hours worth of sermons and I really want to do it in about eight minutes, okay? But Think for a second, if you would, about that thing that you're hardest on. What is it? Are you, are, you, are you the hardest judge maybe on drug dealers? Maybe that's your thing? Child pornography. Is that where you're like, like, that? I, like it's easy to hate those people, right? Okay. Racism. Like, maybe that's it. Okay. I guarantee you this. You've got a Nineveh in your spirit somewhere. You've got something that if God were to smite them today, you would smile. 
You got something. I guarantee you. I, I do. I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm saying it's a reality of the human experience. Okay? Like there are some things where if I, if I found out that God stuck it to that guy and tore like it, like there's a part of me internally. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying I'm human that I would, that I would have to fight going. <laughs> like it feels like, like a good thing just happened. And I want you to understand that God went to Jonah and said, go to those people you can't stand the most, whose behavior makes you sick in the greatest way, whose offensiveness is so like life altering for you. Yeah, go help them. Leave your chair, leave your boat, leave your home and go. See, I want to make sure that we don't do this. We don't want to ever reduce following the, the creator of all the universe. We don't want to reduce following the creator of the universe all the way down to making sure we're in church on a Sunday. What we do want to do is make sure that we understand that the creator of all the universe cared enough about you that he sent his son to give his life to pay the price for your sin so that he could then utilize you as a perfectly redeemed human being to go do other wonderful and great things. Following God in this world is not about following him to the church house on Sunday. Following God is about following him to our Ninevehs. The truth is, if you have a great passion towards some injustice, it's probably because God is calling you to do something about it. If you have a great passion towards something that just physically makes you sick, when you think about it, it's quite possible that God's ready for you to stop thinking about it and start doing something about it. Go to Nineveh. You see, following God is not about following him to the church house for an hour on Sunday. Following God is about hearing the beautiful things commanded, guided, directed from his voice for you and I to live out. And it changes people's lives. Now, I love this about this story. See, when I was younger, I thought I was a pretty good communicator. I thought I was fairly persuasive as a leader. And I remember thinking things like, you just put me in a room with a lost man, folks, we'll get him saved. What I, what I really was internally probably thinking was I can articulate the gospel clearly enough and with enough motivation that, of course, he or she is going to respond in a positive and good way. And I can, we use terms like soul winning. I can do it. That's what I thought. I love in this story. I love it. Do you understand that Jonah preached a sermon he did not want anyone to even listen to? Jonah was like, Jonah, you're all going to die, and you deserve it, and I'm going to smile when it happens. That's, that's Jonah's sermon, right? Like, that's, that's Jonah's sermon, and then they start repenting. They start repenting, and, and, and I don't want to give up too much about next week, but, but we start to see Jonah go, wait, stop. Like, keep sinning so God will kill you. Stop it. Like, what? what? No, no. I, I did it too well. I preached too well. Do you get the irony and almost humor from this story that reminds me and you that it's not about us? Like us being a blessing to someone who's broken and lost is not so that we might motivate and convince them to say yes to the gospel. No, us Loving and caring for and being kind to someone who needs to hear the gospel is about us showing glory to the Father. And if somebody's going to change their mind, it's not going to be me. It's not going to be you. But just as God changed Jonah's mind, and just as God changed the Ninevites' mind, we've got to trust that God is in the midst of changing their mind, which is why I want to go to them. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is a beautiful story about how God just wants to utilize you to bring him glory and change people's minds. And we can do that. Now, we're never going to do that by just getting in church. 
that, that's a good thing to be in church. I'm not saying don't be in church, but I'm saying that is, that's, like a, that's like a starting line, and the race is over at the finish line. And the finish line is where you and I hear the word of the Lord. Sometimes some of us have to hear it again, right? And again, and again, but we hear the word of the Lord, the guidance, the direction that he has for us, and we do it. We follow him. We bring glory and honor to him by choosing to do what he's told us to do, and then we get to watch him do amazing things through those situations. That's the Jonah story. That's hopefully our story. And last week, I got to spend eight days with 26 people who decided it was time they do something like that. And so I'd like to invite any of them who are in this room to join me up front. I know that we'll have more at the 11 gathering than we do now, but if you guys would come up here, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to share a little bit about what God has done through you in the past week. Let me grab you guys a microphone. So for those who are watching online and for those who are here who might not know everybody's name, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to just we're gonna say our name and just like one sentence of how we're connected to community fellowship. Just, you know, just, you know, like one. And then, and then I want you to share with us something that was meaningful and beautiful from you. What's that? You're lost? Okay. I want you to share your name. Let's, let's, let's illustrate your name. Hannah. There we go. That was good. Did she do well? She did well. I think last name might be helpful as well. Keith. There we go. Hannah Keith. Hannah Keith. We got Hannah and Keith. Uh, so I'm, I'm using, she's an illustration. Hannah, how, how are you connected? For people who don't know you, how are you connected to community fellowship? Like, like no, like, like your parents go here. Oh yeah. My parents go here. And you've attended the church about how long? Since I was in like third grade. Okay. So that, that's, so that's, that's, there's your one or two sentences. That's what I'm saying. Just a little bit of that. And then I'm going to hand this to Hannah and let her tell us about her experience in Mexico. <laughs> You're going to do awesome. Share with Okay, so this week is actually really hard for a lot of us. Um, but I could not have been more proud of my team, especially like, where's he at? Brayden and Caleb, since I teach them in Sunday school. For a fifth and sixth grader coming with a bunch of older people, I think I was most proud of their dedication and their hard work without complaining because that was definitely hard. Um, yeah, this week was very life-changing for a family that didn't have anything to we now have a house built for them. And just to see the smiles on their faces and when I presented the keys to their house, the tears in their eyes, you could definitely tell that they were thankful. Hello, I am Kristen Woodward. I'm married to this guy and this one's mine. Yeah, that one, that one. Raise your hand, Jeremy, so they know it's not James. <laughs> and I have that one down there, too, who doesn't, he didn't get to go on this trip. He's still a little too young. Um, I'm probably a familiar face. I sing and play and do all kinds of pretty things here, so. Um, Mexico. Wow, we built a house. <laughs> and we really did it in three days. Uh, when we walked up on this site, it's just dirt. So imagine that parking lot, but not rocks. Like you had to dig super hard. Um, <laughs> it kind of felt like you were busting up concrete a little bit instead of just scooping up some rocks. It was um, intense, but with the 26, 27 of us, we were able to do that within what? 30 minutes or an hour, we hacked that up. Um, so that progression of <laughs> nothing but cement rocks <laughs> to the daily things of just building. I mean, you kind of get lost because you're just working so hard and you, you forget that it's not just about how you're swinging a hammer or <laughs> Because some of us don't, we really, didn't really know how to swing a hammer. Or you, or you hit your finger. She didn't share that story. She kind of busted up her finger pretty bad. There's a picture, but I don't know if you have that one. <laughs> it was disgusting. Because <laughs> I had to help her. Um, 
we went into the home was it the second day to pray with the family we actually had a structure around us and the lady the mother the wife of the family her name was adriana hernandez and she busted out in tears she couldn't talk to us barely we tried because we know a little spanish but we couldn't really have a full conversation. Google Translate didn't hardly work there. Um, when that happened for me, it was more than just a house. We did something that they were never going to be able to do. Her husband makes about $90 a week. A week, people. Think about that. We can make that in a few hours, $90 a week. He walks or rides a bike to where he has to go and do his factory job. Four children, and it also looked like they had other family that were they were helping to support. It looked like they supported each other. And I'll this, um, in order to make that $90 a week, his 13-year-old son goes to work with him every day and works alongside of dad. So that's for dad and the 13 year old son working together to make that $90 a week. I mean, it's just, anyway. But here she is crying about this home that we've built for them. And yes, we got to do the electrical work, but there's still no running water. So there's no real kitchen. There's still no toilet. There's no bathroom. Can you imagine having a home and you, you have no toilet? <laughs> Their facilities were outside of it with a small curtain. Um, that's, that was their home. So us building this other structure, it's kind of like someone coming in and gifting us with a brand new car and a mansion. That's really what it's like in our terms of reality here. So when that happened for her, it just really took me back to, one, I need to be more thankful. I have so much, I'm in need of nothing. I, all I want is want. And two, she was so filled with love for strangers. So were the neighbors who let us into their home to, because as I said, there was really nowhere to use the restroom. So we were going to have to go outside as well. Put that together and see if you would want to do that. <laughs> The, the neighbors opened up their home so that we could go in and use their restroom. Um, I, want, I also want you to think about this because this is another whole thing that put it into perspective for me. 26, 27 people, including our missionary, walking all the way through their home, dirty boots, I mean, sweat pouring off of us, 111 degree temperature. Sweat is literally, I don't usually show sweat. My shirt was soaked. I mean, I'd move and my pants couldn't stay up because I was dripping sweat. Um, they, they let us come through their home. And I don't know if I had a bunch of strangers at my neighbor's yard working on a home because they didn't have anything to utilize. In all reality, would I really let 27 people trump through my home and mess it up and get it dirty and use my bathroom? Would I even let them use my basement bathroom? I don't even know how I would respond to that. Of course, I would want to say, yeah, I would do that. But would I really that lady was in there cleaning her bathroom to make sure it looked good enough and was nice enough for us. I definitely wouldn't go in and clean before a construction worker came in my home. <laughs> so yeah, putting it all into perspective. Be thankful. And just love the heck out of people. <laughs> because isn't that, in the end, all that we really want? Amen? That's my Mexico story. <laughs> you get to pick. Who's next? Brayden, I love you. So my name is Brayden Woodward. I'm 12 years old, and I've been here since I've been eight. And my Mexico story is pretty much just about being there and loving everybody there. 
Like, we, nobody here is going to build a house for someone like we did there. It's it's an amazing experience, and if we could, we would have, everybody would have come, but no, nope, not everybody wants to come. It's just, it's just an amazing experience to me and everybody else on the stage, and every the 26 of us, we had an amazing time. We went to a cold spring. We went to the marketplace at Mexico, and we got to do that several times, but the real meaning was, like my mom said, when Adriana cried when she just saw the structure. She didn't, she didn't even see a full house yet. She just started bawling into tears, and it made everybody's day, because here you'd have to see, like, 20 Lamborghinis, 15 mansions to cry like that. <laughs> <laughs> but she saw just a structure and they have no car just one bike to get to work and she had a structure of a house and she started crying and that just made it so heartbreaking for all of us and I can't really say anything after that so that's my Mexico story I figured that was coming uh, my name is Jeremy Woodward. Uh, I've been connected with this church for, uh, I guess, since its origination. Um, I'm a deacon here. So my Mexico story, they stole all my good points, um, so I don't have a lot left. Um, but a, f a few thoughts, um, just trying to plan and, and prepare for this trip. I had several concerns. Um, I like to eat, so I was worried about the food. I like to sleep, so I was worried about my bed. Um, and then the drive there and back, you know, that's, that's a long time. However, my concerns were, were minimal. So the, the sleeping arrangements, we got there, had this nice, like, uh, memory foam bed. It was, it was super comfortable. Um, the ride there and back was a blessing in and of itself just because, um, you know, got to know some more people uh, deeper, better, um, Two guys that I uh, knew before, I got to know them a lot better. I feel like they're um, some great, great friends now. So that was a blessing. Um, and how can you take a 40-hour ride slash drive and turn it into a blessing? Um, only God can do that. Um, and then the food, oh, my goodness, amazing. I weighed this morning. I gained a good three pounds, and I'm pretty sure I sweated at least 30 pounds out while I was there. Um, the food was great. Um, on that note, the last day that we were there, the family next to the family were actually building the house, um, prepared a, a phenomenal feast for us. Um, it was it was superb, um, and I I believe that that God put that family there, however many years ago, for us, um, because they they catered to our every need. Um, they they prepared food for us, let us use the bathroom, and they were such a blessing to me. And it, it really put things in perspective. You know this, but it just really hit it home that we're all God's children. You know, we couldn't hardly communicate with them, but we just, you could palpate the Holy Spirit there. It was absolutely amazing. Um, you just, you, everybody's God's children, whether you're young, old, black, white, Mexican, American, um, we're all God's children and just love one another. And uh, again, to reiterate, I was going to share this story. We, different people tried to give them things. They would have nothing. They just looked up at the sky, and I don't know what they were saying, but something along the line of just, it's for God. Praise God. We're doing God's work. Um, and they, w they didn't want anything from us. They just wanted to give, give, give. Um, so that's, that's my Mexico story. Oh, well, I wasn't going to show that. I hid money in their towel cabinet, so they'll find it one day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go? That's funny. My name's Kelsey Davidson, and I've been going to community since, like, fifth grade, and my aunt and uncle actually brought me. Um, James and Christy. And so this week has it's been pretty amazing we actually grew a lot with the adults that we didn't really know 
and our room was crazy for the girls. I can tell you that. You get delirious in the heat down there, just so you know. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Um, and then so where we stayed at the first night, it was a little tough since we thought that we didn't have air, so that was going to be really hard for the girls. But then, um, like that night, we actually some of us went outside to the community and played with some kids that, that, that like lived around. And they were just so thankful for us to be there and to spread his word with them. And most of them went to the church that was next, like in the compound that we stayed at. And so they would tell us that they would go to church for four hours, which is a really long time. <laughs> um, but, and then also at the work site, um, a lot of us, like we grew with the family and we had a like a close bond with the little kids. And so that's something that I will never forget. I'm Tammy Creason. I've been here since 2006, I think. And I cleaned the church. This build was different than the one we did two years ago because this family this year, they had nothing. I mean, they literally had nothing. And what was it, like a 10 by what, what were they living in? 10 by 10, 10, yeah. They were living in a 10 by 10? Yeah, like a lot of them. Yeah, one bed. I mean, it, it was, we thought we were going there to give them a house, and they blessed us just as much with what we got from them. Uh, my name is Jane Creason, and I've been going to church as long as, well, since I was born, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. And so, uh, um, uh, 2006. Wait, I don't know. 2004. So I've been here since before then. Okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, to walk on a site and see that there's just gravel, and then three days later there's a house. Pretty amazing. Um, this family was different than the last time we went because this family, the dad took off work to help us build the house. He was on the roof nailing. Uh, hammering nails and uh, instead of making him his family money and uh, yeah All right. I'm Adam Mathis uh, I've been going here for probably nine months uh, my wife's been going here a little bit while longer than me um, this trip was spectacular uh, it meant a lot to all of us as you've heard um, but let me, I, I want to fill you in on your part. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew, I didn't know this until the trip home yesterday. Um, the, the church, people that give money to this church, y'all are the ones who paid for the house. We paid for our way down there, our food, our stay. Um, but the money that, that you gave, $6,900, mm -hmm. is what built this, these people a house. And it, it was a house, and it, it met a lot of their needs. As you talk, it, they talked about the day that... Um, that uh, Adriana, you know, broke down in front of us, and it, it meant a lot, you know. Um, but, but it, it wasn't just us. It, it was all this this church, this local church, bought all the materials for that house, um, and, and it didn't just meet the physical needs of these people. Uh, this family saw the love of Christ in action, and uh, I'm a very logical person, and you know. Hearing him talk today about, you know, people preaching the gospel, being very persuasive. Uh, there's nothing you can say that can really persuade someone to, to, or make someone see the love of Christ like what just happened, like what you funded uh, this past week. Um, but not only for this family, the last day we were there, we finished the dedication. Uh, I went to the, our van to get a jug of water, I think it was. And uh, this guy came riding up on his bicycle, just some dude. I, I going somewhere, I don't know. Um, he didn't speak English. I don't speak Spanish. Um, but he told me uh, through, you know, gestures and what little few words I know in Spanish um, that the community knows who we are and what we did, and they all are praising God because of it. So the money that you gave didn't just meet the needs of this family, didn't just 
uh, give us this great experience where we got to see the love of Christ poured out through us into this family. This whole community worshiping God right now and for the years to come that they're going to see this house every day and be reminded that some you know, people in America, they, they love God and they love this family and they were willing to, to give this money to them. So know that, that you had a very huge part in God being worshipped in a hundred of people, hundreds of people's lives for the foreseeable future. Uh, so just know that there's, it, wouldn't, it wasn't us, it was us, is what Christ did uh, through all of us. Um, my Mexico story is a little different than what you've heard. Um, I've been struggling with God and Christ a little bit before I left. I got to go on a walk to Emmaus, which built me up a little bit. But uh, any of y'all that know me know that I connect with God through nature. I, I see God in nature everywhere we go. But we were sitting in this little spring, and uh, I started looking up the spring, and I was sitting downstream, just sitting in the water, and I just started talking to God. Uh, I don't know how long I was sitting there, but God just sort of started talking to me about what's going on, what this trip means, not just to the people of this team and the people in the community and stuff, but what he meant to me. And I realized for the rest of the trip, he just kept pounding on me. I've got something for you. I don't know what it is yet. And... I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I realized that God is calling me to the mission field somewhere. I don't know what it is. I don't know the logistics of it. Uh, honestly, it scares the hell out of me. It does. I, I'm not scared. I can go ride a motorcycle 200 mile an hour and never wink an eye. I can jump out of an airplane, never blink an eye, but this scares me. I don't know what it is. But God put me on this mission trip for that family at that time and this group because my few skill sets helped someone else do their skill sets, and we made a complete team. God can take a rose bush with a bunch of thorns, put it together, and make a beautiful bouquet. And this is what he did with this team and that family. So I need your prayers. Amen. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't. So. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thank you so So today is Father's Day, and uh, I know it's about out of typical time here, but uh, I, I personally want to dedicate today Father's Day to Alejandro uh, Hernandez, who's the father in this. We didn't get as much time with Alejandro because Alejandro went to work every day. Now, he went in late when we said he took off work. He, he went in late, but he went to work every day, and I, I'm sharing that with you for this reason. Uh, there are probably some dads like me in this room who feel a great sense of responsibility to provide for their family and think things like, I'm just going to confess thoughts that kind of went through my mind. Uh, what kind of dad lets his wife and kids live in this situation? Like those kinds of thoughts run through your mind. Like, you know, I, I remember that on the first 30 minutes, first hour thinking, I, you know, I wonder if this guy's lazy, you know, am I the only heathen in the room that would have had those kinds of thoughts? You know, like kind of run it. Here's what I saw. I saw a man who worked six days a week in 100 degree weather, I guarantee you, in a building that had no air conditioning and took his 13-year-old son out of school to go and work with him. And the two of them working six days a week in 100 degree plus weather with no air conditioning rode a bicycle back and forth to get there every day. And he made less money than many of us make before lunch on a Monday, right? Um, and so I just want to declare to you and say my thanks. I was so, I was taught by Alejandro what it means to be a husband and father. Does that make sense? Just the dedication that he had was motivating and encouraging to me. So uh, I'm thanking God for him and for his family. Um, would you do this? This is our altar call today. We're praying for the Hernandez family. We're praying for Acuna, Mexico. And we're praying for all that God is doing in their lives. We're just going to sing one verse or so of this song. 
Some of you may want to come down front and pray. Some of you may sit where you are. Please stand if you'd like. But let's, let's worship Jesus and let's pray for this family. Okay? You guys could be seated. Thank you so much, team, for leading us. That was great. Um, as we finalize the day, I, I want to remind you guys of, of all the family members' first names. You've heard these over and over and over, okay? So different folks from the group, tell us. Just re, re, like, Dad's name was? I know them all, but I want you, Dad's name was? Alejandro. He's probably about 30, be my guess. Mom's name was? Adriana. Okay, oldest son, 13. His name was? Julian, it's spelled Julian, okay, but it's pronounced Julian. Uh, next son down, name was? Jesus, spelled Jesus, right? Okay, that, <laughs> pronounced Jesus. Uh, third child was the little girl who stole everybody's hearts. Her name was? Amy, okay. And then little baby, his name was? Dylan, okay. So you guys can be praying for that family. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to be doing baby dedications at the end of the next gathering, um, and, and so we, we're not, we, you, we don't like double dedicate them, you know, like we'll do them both gatherings. But, uh, one of those children, um, is Stephen Jackson and Kayla Jackson's newborn. And, uh, and I, I know Stephen's here. Stephen, are you still around, buddy? Miss him? He stepped. Okay. You guys know the Jacksons. We're excited about baptizing. or, whoa, I about said baptizing. We're in a Baptist church. What am I doing here? We're, 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 we're going to be do, dedicating and praying for their child. And, um, uh, that we're excited about that. I'd love for you guys to, to know that. If you're not going to be able to be here for that, then watch online. Josh, can we make sure that this first service does not auto-delete like it typically does so that all the testimonies we just heard could be heard? I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, so keep in mind a couple of things. One is children's camp, which comes in July. Uh, I have some details that were texted to me during the service. I want to make sure. I think we probably have a slide for children's camp. Let's make sure that, uh, that you guys are aware of this. Okay, children's camp is for, very specifically, um, rising fourth through sixth graders. You had to have completed third grade to go. 
It's at Southland Ranch in McCracken County. It's $50 a child. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor a student, you can by giving a $50 gift or even a partial sponsorship's fine. Uh, just let us know in your check that's what it's for, and we'll make sure it helps a kid go. But sign up is the 21st of this month. So uh, we, you only have five days left to sign a child up. You can do so at cfconnect.info, the website we use for signups. Or you can just grab Cody, okay? Grab Cody, our children's ministry director, and, and let her know that you want to do this. So that's, uh, that's going to happen July 6th through the 8th. It's a blast. We do this in partnership with Reedland Baptist Church in Paducah. So it will be a really, really good camp. I want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Uh, also want to make sure uh, that you are reminded of the t-shirt. Remember, today is the day to order it. We are, we're taking those orders today. We're ordering them tomorrow, okay? So I want to make sure you don't miss out on that. I love you guys so much. Thank you for being here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, at the kitchen, there's a sign-up sheet and a place for you to leave your five bucks. That's a great question. Thank you for that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Guys, have a wonderful Father's Day. Thank you very much. We love you. Have a good day.